I've been in the UK for 22 years, uh, University of Liverpool, University of Lancaster. Um, my um, been working on complexity for about 18 years, stumbled into it thanks to an Iraqi colleague. He and I were arguing, he was an engineer, and we were debating over what is it that keeps the European Union together, ironic at this time. Uh, and he was saying, well, it functions as a complex system. I was sort of like, you know, I'd heard, I dabbled in that, had a bit of background in the sciences when I was at undergraduate. But he and I went back and forth, we kept arguing, and da da da, and then finally I became, in essence, a convert. And uh, for me, what complexity is, it, it's, it, it's become my meta-theoretical framework. So in other words, whenever I think of something, my wife actually now says, look, enough of the C word, because I can't, you know, so I try not to use the word itself. But for me, every time I'm confronted with a, a whether it's a policy situation or dealing with my students or even a conference like this where literally your choices right now of where you sat all are complex adaptive interactions. You're looking at the room, you quickly scan it, you quickly see who the actors are, you sit here, yet at the same time, so at the same time in every all these social situations there is structure, the tables are sitting there, and yet at the same time there's complexity interacting actors who are pursuing their individual things and don't even know where they're going to sit uh, at when, before they come in the room, yet you will quickly adapt and adjust to the others around you. And then there's unpredictability. Somebody could have spilt their coffee on the way in, but they see that they're on the, the trousers, they've got to run back out. And since all of these are combining all the time, for me, fundamentally, why is it that we don't think of our policies in this? Why do we always tend to put a sort of a mechanic, uh, if you will, and I'll use the metaphor, a mechanistic, a sort of a clockwork metaphor, framework thinking onto our policy actions when we know in our hearts they're not? This just doesn't happen. So I'll walk through that and what that goes on. Uh, I've done a bunch of stuff over the years, uh, diabetes, drug advertising, GP commissioning. I do a lot of stuff in health. Um, is that sort of an answer, but my background is actually in international political economy. Oops. So, if I get this right, whoops, wrong way. So, uh, very quickly, uh, if you think about uh, the UK, uh, so I'll just focus on that. The UK, and it's always, as somebody who's come from the United States with a federal structure and a much more decentralized structure, the UK is one of the most centralized policy structures uh, around. Uh, you just it's just constantly river. So you have the original sort of Westminster model, uh, rationalized, centralized, hierarchical, what, uh, the wave from the 70s, new public management, which is basically an intensified rationalization focused on the self-interest of actors. You then moved on to evidence-based policy making. The belief was all we have to do is get better evidence and we will create better policy. So the accumulation of evidence linked to of targeting an audit culture because you can get better evidence that means you can define the appropriate policies once you define the appropriate policies it's getting those local actors to do as they're told <laughs> you establish targets you establish audits i have a very good friend of mine who was a C who was a ceo at a major hospital uh, in um, uh, in the northwest and i asked him once how many targets are you supposed to hit on a daily basis yeah. He said, oh, that's a good question. Uh, we tallied them up one day, 364. I said, how on earth do you manage that many targets? You know, he quietly says, well, more or less, we have to ignore a good chunk of them. There's no way we can manage that. We pick the top 10 or 20, focus on those. But the big problem is those top or 20 interact with each other. So if we want to lower uh, waiting times in accident and emergency, we've got to take resources from somewhere else. We've got to move, shift things here, shift things there. So if you will, that sort of big push towards that target, order, more targets, better information called better policy. Then you moved on to, if you remember, our, you know, this is pre-Brexit days of the, what was supposed to be the big uh, society or bonfire of the targets, linked to the new mantra of doing more with less, which obviously was linked into austerity. Okay, let's cut back on the, uh, on the local authority money. Um, uh, which was a way of decentralizing the pain uh, and responsibility while maintaining central control. You basically, it's a great way to uh, control local authorities, cut back on things, demand that they uh, 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 have to fulfill certain criteria, 
literally local authorities have hardly any control over the budgets anymore. Marginal fraction, a couple of percentage points. And I would argue, this is my personal opinion, it link on very much a war on the weak. This is our precariat. You can have all, we can have all sorts of debates. So. And uh, Northern Poorhouse, not Powerhouse, this is linked with a devolution agenda. I'd argue the devolution agenda is all about reallocating a budget. Yes, they're talking about putting a budget in the North, uh, but that budget is a shrunken amount of money relative to what was before. So, uh, but I don't want to get too much into those particular battles because we've got other uh, sort of things to look at. So for me, there has been a, a, a post-war tendency in the UK towards this continual centralized hierarchy, of, if you will, command and control structure, uh, that, of which evidence-based policymaking, this target audit culture, is merely the latest version. And there'll be more. Uh, there'll be the next wave of stuff coming on. Obvious weaknesses to this, everybody gets it. Weakness, misdirection, blunt, over-controlling, resources, ignores local actors, all that sort of stuff. My personal argument, again, Brexit amplifies this tendency. Because if you're the one making the deal, via Whitehall, via London, uh, you need to have more control. You're the one setting the bargains via Brussels. And so therefore, you're actually able to intensify uh, your central control. And if you look at the number of civil servants, I have a colleague of mine who works on this, total number of civil servants uh, you know, sort of that have been hired in by, uh, by Whitehall, it now exceeds what was the previous high under the Blair years. Okay, So you now have a larger civil service than you previously did under Big Spending Blair. Uh, key hidden change in all of this is how it affects the difference between England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. So there's interesting stuff going on, despite this general tendency. So, if you think about this, how has this affected health policy? Well, if you look at the health policy last 20 plus years, you've had at least 23 major reorganizations. So it's reorganized, reorganized, reorganized. New actor comes in, uh, and so you've got your current uh, commissioning renegotiations for those people who doing the GP. I've done some work on GP commissioning. Um, just the latest line of this, and it's a friend of mine said it's the IMT syndrome. IMT stands for in my time. New minister, new head of the NHS comes in. Before me was chaos. Look at what a mess the NHS is in. Luckily, I've come here to save it. I have the plan. We will implement the plan. I will move the levers and the NHS will radically improve in my time. Strangely enough, that person then goes on, the next person comes in, look at what a mess this is. Thank goodness I'm here in time to save it. And the same thing repeats. So you have this process, and the reorganization is a symbol of that. Now, one could argue, is this keeping the NHS healthy or critically undermining it? Depends on how you look at it. From a traditional, maybe this orderly clockwork mechanistic approach, you need these reorganizations to constantly adapt to the changing situation. From a complexity perspective, actually the local actors are the ones who are constantly <coughs> adjusting and adapting, and if you will, saving the system from these continual <coughs> reorganizations. It's their ability to adapt and adjust at a local level that's actually the hidden strength. Okay. So how has this affected education? Test, test, test. Okay, a lovely report from uh, Cambridge Report 2009. The UK now has the most, or in England, uh, excuse me, now has the most evaluated schools, the most tested students, huge cost is buried in all of this, and a significant diversion of resources and learning. Okay. Uh, only moderate improvement. Okay. So, recent challenge, and er, you think about the recent challenge re centralization of all funding, increasing of controls and constraints on testing. Increasing political control over testing, the definition of what the testing is supposed to, do, supposed to be. Uh, HE sector, so my sector also gets hit with this pretty heavily now. Not only do we have these research evaluation, teaching evaluation factors, another one called KEF is coming, knowledge exchange framework is supposed to be coming in. Uh, and all of this is then wrapped around austerity where budgets are increasingly tightened you can then demand increased central control with that tighter budget. So uh, arguably, if you look at uh, academic success in the UK, works for elites. No question, the elites structures you know, do very well, punch above their weight. 
go down, move below the elites? And, uh, you know, that's the big question. Social policy. So uh, hopefully some of you have heard of this. There was Eileen Monroe from the LSE did a fantastic review of social policy in 2010. It's a services. Her argument's very basically you wind up with a, a, a rules, rules, rules. And what's meant by social policy, she describes, so she was a social worker in 1970. She remembers the social worker booklet at the time was about 60 to 70 pages. It's currently five to 600, okay? Something goes wrong, you add a rule, you put it in the book, and therefore you've solved the problem, okay? Uh, from the, uh, her arguments, you know, from the document, I encourage you, this is one of the best pieces of work on social policy I've personally ever seen. She's absolutely genius. Skewing priorities uh, that develop between the demands of management, inspection process, and professionals. Use, uh, ability to use her. So in other words, the process itself dominates rather than the focus on the child. Following rules and being compliant with those rules is much more important for the social worker than it is for the child. You're protected if you're the social worker. So long as you follow those rules, whatever happens to the child, you're safe. Uh, operating over standardized framework, performance data collected, a great effort. It doesn't describe what really matters. You can get the data, but you know, is that actually helping? More on this. Uh, again, I love this report. Uh, it's available online. Just type it in. Uh, what you need, in a sense, for counter arguments, you need a system that learns whether the child is being helped, how they're exposed, innovating in response to feedback. In other words, some sort of interaction going on. It's free from all but essential. <coughs> central of course, you've got to have some degree of central pres uh, prescription, uh, professional practice, et cetera. Professional practice, they have to be informed by research. The big thing is informed here. Again, learning to use those resources outside, but at the same time, adjusting it to their specific situation. And that expects errors, and so tries to treat risk sensible. So in other words, what often happens in social work is those <coughs> in the area know crisis, if some horrible event happens, a child is tortured to death by their parents, and social workers didn't pick it up. And the media takes a big focus on this, and you then identify, well, what was it that that social worker did? They didn't notice that uh, the child uh, bruises were covered up because the parents had them wear long sleeve shirts on the, on the arm, so the, so the social worker couldn't see it. So you write a rule into the system, right, every Social worker must now test and look at the ask the arm to be pulled up so that they can see it. Uh, intrusive, difficult to establish a relationship with the parents, more sort of difficulty as well. Risk sensible rather than rule oriented because you know uh, this is uh, there'll be another tragedy, but that tragedy will be different. Even if the actors, even if the actors say, okay. Uh, you know, or, or the parents, they'll realize, oh right, I know that they're gonna come up and roll up the arms, so I'll you know, do something nasty somewhere else, okay? So it's, it's about being reasonable. Easy to say, uh, to sort of say, well, we've gotta be all this flexible, do all this stuff. Easy to say, hard to do. For UK central actors, they're often held responsible if local actions go wrong. Hard to get away from the expression, which I've been hearing for 22 years since I've been here, something must be done, okay? Lessons must be learned. This is the endless re repetition that I've heard ever since I've come here. Right, X was terrible, we've got to learn the lessons, we will now implement it. The problem is the next situation will be different. And so the notion that you'll be able to exactly copy that answer to that situation and it'll fit the next is false. Um, and then it leads to a new target and audit. So you'll put a new target in the system, you'll evaluate it, are they doing the thing, and does it work? So for local actors, increased freedom, responsibility, and uncertain can be dangerous and uncertain for them, okay? You're a local actor, you're implementing these things. Protocols can often be quite helpful. You, know, you feel protected. I follow the protocol, I should be safe. Often support targets, often local actors will support targets as a way to provide protection, both legal and socially. Okay. Local level, despite doing amazing and impressive work, surprise, surprise, local actors aren't angels. Okay. <laughs> they do need monitoring, they do need review. How do we separate this process? How do we create this? 
And obviously, big thing, wider social values play a role in all of this. How to get society, how do we get society to recognize failures happen? Okay? Actually, interactions with X number of interactions, you're gonna have Y number of mistakes. It's human nature. We do. That's the way it is. The notion of perfection merely distorts our uh, reality of that. And yeah, in the car, in the case of our social care or health care, um, yeah, there is failure and there are horrible results, no question. So uh, here we're at you know my job, if you will. What are, what can academics do about it? Uh, and I guess for me. And what my work has been, it's about trying to get to the root cause of this. What is it that creates this, if you will, this uh, social scientific belief in this preeminence of this orderly rational structure that we always sort of revert back to, particularly in the UK. And this is, relates to an American uh, philosopher back from the night. I find myself going back to this. It was a lovely, actually, an educational philosopher, John Dewey, and this pursuit of the quest for certainty. You know, this desire, let's get it, let's make it certain, let's make it certain. How do we create this quest? And then I try to flip this into looking at it in complexity and adding some new sort of concepts and tools about this. Big thing, hopefully this allows us to understand the strengths and weaknesses, and there are strengths of the current system, I don't dispute that at all, and develop reasonable ways of dealing with this. Recognize that it applies to all policy areas. I can take, I make the argument constantly, I can put this, you give me a policy area, I'll apply a complexity framework to it. And then culturally, how do you get society to accept the fact that policy actors are dealing with messy complex situations and cannot be expected to achieve 100% results? In fact, if they are, you should know they're either lying, cheating, or the system is rigged. Whoops. <laughs> Uh, and then, in a way, one can argue that actually you can do with complexity, I would argue, you can, this was a mantra a couple of years ago, you can do more with less, uh, but it doesn't guarantee success. And uh, in other words, if somebody comes in and says, yeah, complexity will guarantee you're going to be much better, uh, laugh them away and move on to the next consultant, okay? Because it will, it gives you some rules, it gives you some uh, ways of framing it. But complexity recognizes you're going to have failure. They're not going to eliminate. This isn't the, the magical answer. But it's a way of thinking about the world. Now, what I'm going to do, <laughs> I'm going to compress what I take a couple of weeks to teach my students into one or two slides for you. Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, you know, so don't worry. The way to think about this, this paradigm or this framework of order, where does it come from? And in a way, I go back to, uh, you know, you could pick 20 different thinkers. Isaac Newton, this is our gravity where there's universal laws. I mean, imagine how exciting and how amazing it was. And Isaac Newton himself was very religious. He saw the hand of God when he found the rules of gravity, not only that they work everywhere, so around the, uh, around the earth and around the universe, they worked everywhere and they worked over time. He was able to say, we've established a law of the way the world functions. And for him, it was the hand of God. He was, a lot of his, in his writings, he's saying, I've, I've, I've literally been able to see, you know, humans are now able to see because it's this universal rule. So this belief in raw law, uh, you know, universal laws that don't change over time or place, combined with Rene Descartes, I use him as a symbol, of, I think, therefore I am, of human rationalism. Combine the ability of humans to be rational, 100% rational was the implication, with laws, and you have the belief that you can create order in society, and you can know it, and you can lock it into place. Okay? This comes back to one of my favorite quotes. If it, you know, so Simone de Laplace basically saying, if we know the positions, uh, motion of all the particles in the universe, we could uh, calculate the behavior at any time in the past or the future. Put that on the human beings. If we can know the way the laws of human beings, we can know what they should be, or what they in the past and the future. So we can know where society is going. We can know how to push it in that direction. And for those of you who are older, like myself, you heard the sort of modernist of early pl town planning, 60s, 70s kind of stuff. That was the vision. We will make society better by clearing off all these old terrible old you know, Victorian buildings and 
put in these absolutely beautiful concrete uh, monstrosities. <laughs> so the vision of this, I, I just physically think of it, is literally the whole idea with the sciences and with the social science was uh, you have this disorderly area and with human effort, academic thinking, universities, you know, we're gonna push our uh, this disorder, we're gonna push uh, the world from a disorderly world into an orderly one. Okay, so human effort moves it into these rules of gravity, motion, and we have under, uh, you know, on this zone we still have the unknown, we don't know everything yet, but more effort will push more and more onto the orderly side. For rules of this, uh, by the way, I'm happy to, if anybody, I, you can, I'll share that, you don't have to desperately write these things down. This is just imagine a mechanical clock, and you're looking at your four rules or your causality. Given causes need known effect. Wind the clock, add energy, the clock starts to move. Reductionism, the system can be broken apart. I can take the pieces of the clock apart, I can move them around, uh, I can know them. The whole is the sum of the parts. Predictability, once we define uh, the, how the clock's gonna work, I know three hours later the hands will move three hours around. And determinism, the clock won't all of a sudden go backwards. It'll flow smoothly going forwards around. It won't jerk a lot. It won't stop and sort of jiggle around. We can do this, okay? So this is sort of four, four rules on this. Problem with this vision, and again, I'm rushing through multiple lectures here. Uh, turn of the century, uh, it starts to break down in the physical world. So if you will, the classical physical <coughs> understanding of the world was a giant clockwork universe. Add in a guy named Henry Poincaré, who was an early uh, mathematician on chaos theory. Albert Einstein's with relativity theory. All you need to know about that was, uh, from Einstein's perspective, what began to happen is the rules that you think about, and here you go to a gentleman by you know, Heisenberg with uncertainty, the rules that we think about at our level of existence aren't the same at a subatomic level or a sort of universal level. So gravity begins to have different rules and meanings depending on which level you are. So even the most basic sort of rules begin to be relative to where you see them, okay? So this is, this is physical sciences, you know, this is nothing that, you know, we're not even touching the social sciences yet. So all of a sudden, instead of everything moving into the orderly box, some stuff is staying in the disorderly box, okay? Now, let's add another sort of layer onto that. New types of systems that were always messy, and if you will, our classical, uh, our, our classical physicists didn't want to look at. Fluid dynamics, the weather, okay? These are always within boundaries. So in other words, they're bounded systems. Uh, so whenever you flush a toilet or allow a vortex to form in your sink and it flows down, it will take a certain shape. But due to the interaction of the water molecules with other impurities, each vortex will be slightly different from the other. Snowflakes are another classic example of this. The snowflakes all have a structure, so there's boundaries to that structure. But within those boundaries, each one varies slightly. Okay? Uh, so complex doesn't necessarily mean complicated. Complex can be a simple thing. So what happens is you begin to have to from this, you have to start changing your rules. You have partial causality, reductionism, and holism. The system <coughs> can be reduced into its part, but actually it then interacts with the whole. Predict you have degrees of predictability, uh, but you also have uncertainty. And the best you can do is probabilistic. You can give a probability to something, but you can't say for certain this will happen. So you begin to be adding more boxes. You've still got your disorderly box. You now have complicated stuff. I can predict the weather in a month's time. I'll, I'll give me parameters of 10 degrees. And yeah, I can, with a high degree of predictability, but if you give me a parameter of one degree and say which degree is, how warm is it gonna be in Birmingham in a, in a month's time, boom, my probabilities start to drop. Okay. So uh, what happens when we start, and this is just physical systems, okay? So we're already dealing with complex situations. We're just looking at physical systems. What happens is we put life into this, okay? Our biological systems. A uh, lovely guy, I don't know, James Lovelock, with the concept of Gaia, the entire globe is a living system, is its, if you will, the highest complexity. And what happens is, here you begin, it's the same sort of rules, but a new one, the bottom one, emergence. 
exhibit elements of adaptation and emergence, meaning life starts to adapt to its surroundings. It reproduces and passes on those adaptations to the next one. So in other words, whatever the creature, given enough time, whatever the life form is, uh, may transform itself over time to emerge into new properties and systems. The flu virus, this year's flu virus, is constantly adapting and adjusting to, to in a sense, to create next year's flu virus. The birds, the sparrows, etc. you can extend the thing so evolution, if you will, takes a longer period, but our flu virus is the real quick one, okay? So in other words, and trying to predict that is what the vaccine, you know, is what the pharmaceuticals are doing all the time, as best they can. Sometimes they get it right, sometimes they don't. Okay. So you've got this emerging, and we're not even in the human systems yet. <laughs> and we're already getting this higher levels of, of complex processes. So again, you add sort of another layer of what's the physical complexity, chaotic complexity. Now, human systems, okay? This is a lovely quote, Peter Allen, Lovely, lovely guy, was one of the early ones. Very, very not reducible mechanical systems, average types. This is, if you will, the detailed description of it. I don't want to go into that. You can have a look at it later. Uh, but the, we had a good, I had a great discussion with him. Human systems that interact, they're interacting with different, uh, uh, obey simple rules, things like that. They resort from ex internal sense making. We human beings have a discussion how we bring it all together. And the way we were sort of arguing, and he said, it's the difference between, if you think of the orderly universe as mechanical, it's like throwing a ball, whereas if I threw a ball, you, uh, you give me enough time, I can make that very accurate, you calculate the force on the ball, I can tell you exactly where it lands. Complex human systems are like throwing a duck. <laughs> Briefly, I'm in control of the duck. You give me a very short time frame, and I can tell you where that human system will be in a short period of time. Extend my time period, and the duck will start going here. Extend it a little dog longer, and the duck may be behind me. Okay, So I have no idea where my duck's going. Human systems are like throwing a duck. So what are our sort of rules for human systems? Same sort of rules, as I said before, probabilistic emergence, interpretation. The actors in the system are aware of themselves, the system, their history may strive to interpret and direct themselves in that system. So on, a, on, on top of a physical complexity, biological complexity, we add a human complexity, okay? So if you will, all these are swirling around us all the time. And so all I've done, you add an extra box here uh, to sort of show the layer of consciousness and human complexity, norms, values, language, narrative that we're dealing with all the time. Uh, I would take our, our Vietnamese visitors uh, who are now at a certain period of history with the English language, who their English language has been learning uh, uh, rapidly, and the delicacy of uh, understanding and language that uh, it takes to learn it, <coughs> interpret it, and then interpret it into a Vietnamese perspective. Internationally, I would say this is one of the most amazing transitions that we're seeing in the current period with the global rise of English. Global rise of English isn't unifying, it's actually diversifying because cultures that previously weren't connected are uh, now connecting and then reinterpreting it into their own world. So lots of interesting things going on there. Anyway, uh, so how does this relate to the social sciences, okay? So I'm gonna go back to our classical vision of our mechanical, remember we're back to Newton and we're back to uh, Descartes, and if you will, Early, sort of Thomas Hobbes with the Leviathan had this vision of creating a structure that once it's in place will lead to a better society. Okay, lots of stuff within Hobbes. Uh, Francois Keyes made er one of the early economists. Economic system is like a mechanical clock. And Condorcet, who uh, it, we lost his neck in the French Revolution, has one of the real things. The sole foundation for the belief in the natural sciences is the idea that general laws directing the uh, phenomena of the universe, known and unknown, are necessary and constant. Why should this principle be any less true for the development of the intellectual and uh, moral faculties of man than for other operations of nature? In other words, if the universe is fundamentally orderly and human beings are part of the universe, therefore they must be orderly too. And the whole point of the social sciences 
is to find out what those orderly bits are and implement them to create an orderly society. Okay. And lots of variations on the attempt to create final orders in society, uh, most have crashed out pretty horrifically. Okay. Uh, and they've taken lots of forms, and don't think that these are just external forms to Western types of thinking. Okay? Plenty of nasty elements here. We no time to do it. Social science 20th century that took this modernization and development theory, rational choices, and behavioralism, positive, all had a drift towards the dominance of the expert or the technocrat. Because if you're the one who knows the future order of the system, well, you're the one that should be listened to, not all these silly local people. Uh, 20th century, I'd say, it takes very much that rise of bureaucracy managerialism. The Westminster policy model comes out of this rational actor model, utilitarian, economic, economistic. Our new public management is clearly how do you rationally accept this? And I would argue very much evidence based policy making is in this historical tendency, just the latest version of it. And then Brexit amplifies it. Continual drift towards centralized control and criteria, but constantly limited by a uh, lack of local knowledge and understanding. So whenever you're dealing with these systems, it's generally the battle is over. How can the central actors get more control over those local actors? Because if the local actors just do what they're told, then the center can know that they're more, you know, they're able to evaluate the system better. And it's those darn local actors that have to be, you have to make sure that they're doing it, what are they doing, I mean, who knows, this is all crazy. Now, uh, I just want to give a quick video break because I've been talking so long, and let me just see if I can get out of this. Now, the, the video is a short three minute video, which is probably one of the best comedy videos about um, complexity by a guy named Dave Snowden, who's one of the early absolute geniuses on uh, complexity, let me just pull. Uh, this up, and hopefully this will work, and we'll all hear it. <laughs> so, yes, it's how to organize a children's party uh, uh, with looking at it from a complexity perspective, an evident, uh, an orderly, uh, evidence-based perspective, and a chaotic perspective. So, total, no rules at all. We'll just hopefully this will work. Let's imagine, if you can, that you've got to organize a party for a bunch of 11-year-old boys, and you want to apply the three different types of systems of in nature. Well, if you assume the party's chaotic, the children are acting at random, you might as well buy the drugs and alcohol so the children can go on a personal experience of self-discovery. Perhaps they don't burn down in the process, but what does that matter? All property is theft and it was socially constructed in the first place. <laughs> and my friends in California have tried this, I don't recommend it. Uh, I'm from California, California by the way. But it's a legitimate approach. On the other hand, the one we'll be more familiar with is the order systems approach. Here, it's of critical importance to construct clearly articulated learning objectives in advance of the party itself. <laughs> the learning objective should, of course, be aligned with the mission statement for education in the society to which you belong. Ideally, you should print the learning objectives off on motivational posters, pictures of eagles soaring over valleys, and water dropping into ponds, and place those around the room where you can hold a party. You then produce a project plan for the party. The project plan should have clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against ideal party outcomes. Um, once you've done that, you know, the senior adult can start the party with a motivational videotape. After all, you don't want the children wasting time in play, which isn't aligned with the learning objectives of the party itself. And then they should use PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the objective of the party and to show the children how pocket money is linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. Now, of course, the third approach, the complexity approach, is even simpler. Here, we draw a line in the sand known as the boundary in complexity theory, and we turn to the children and say, cross that, you little bastards, and you're done. flexible, negotiable boundaries, because rigid boundaries have a habit of becoming brittle and breaking catastrophically. We then use catalytic probes, and I'm deliberately using the jargon of complexity theory now, a football, a videotape, a barbecue, a computer game, Something which will stimulate a pattern of activity which is called an attractor. And if it 
it's a beneficial attractor, we stabilize it, we amplify it. If it's a negative attractor, we dampen it or destroy it fairly quickly. So what we do is we manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries. And in that simple phrase, we see the promise of complexity theory for organizations and government alike. That's it. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I've, I've always loved that. It's also, uh, for our international guests, that's a, that's a very uh, British form of humor, uh, uh, which is absolutely lovely. But to me, it actually captures, as you are all giggling at, at the multitudinous uh, targets and indicators and milestones, you know, and you realize you know, the language that's been developed over the last 10, 15 years, how, how this reflects and how silly it is when you actually apply it to you know, sort of a, a, a situation like that. So I've always loved that. What I want to do is then briefly, so there's a whole range of tools that you can use. I, and I see I've got a couple more minutes here. There's a whole range of tools that you can use that come off complexity. Uh, I'm just going to do one or two. Uh, so one way is what I, I call it, it's mapping politi po uh, pol political dynamics. You can put in any policy field you like into this. And it's just the boxes that we, we saw earlier. And all that I do here is to say, well, if you were looking at politics within a context, you ask yourself, well, what are the orderly bits about party? What are the stable bits that have been there for 20, 30, 50, 100 years? And you'd say, in a British context, you say, OK, basic power resources and political structures. So Westminster's been there, the democratic structures, there's civil service has been there 100 years. You, know, you can say, OK, there's been solid structures that have been there for lengthy periods of time. Now, if you're analyzing those, you can get very good data on them. Uh, the Westminster's there, you can get the data on, on activity uh, you know, there, you can, get, you can get very good data, and you can, imply, uh, you can use quantitative methods. So your data is robust, and your ability to analyze the data is quite good. You move over and you say, well, okay, what do we see that mimics uh, some lower level degrees of, of um, what we say is physical complexity, and we don't, I mean, uh, I had to rush through a bunch of stuff. But the example for that is, sand piles, if you want. Uh, so lots and lots of studies would be done on, if you uh, drop sand onto a disk, this is all from the 50s and 60s, you'll see how high the pile grows. And it will grow a certain level, and then you'll get to a point where it, it reaches a point of, if you will, complexity or criticality, where one more grain of sand might trigger an avalanche where the sand pile goes down. The sand pile will start to hover within certain levels. It's a very similar process to traffic flows, uh, where you have traffic jams, and you can even see it in, in some types of voting decisions within Parliament. Where will the tip occur where it reaches there? You know the majority will votes will be in a certain, uh, will be with a party one way or another, but then you'll get to certain types of decisions where, whoa, it's right on the edge. We're going to see this in Brexit, obviously. Next thing, what sort of uh, process in politics that mimics, if you will, biological complexity, emergent behavior, co-evolution with other actors, well, the interaction of the parties themselves. You can think of the parties themselves as almost as organisms, going after <laughs> resources, interacting with other, uh, cooperating sometimes, uh, fighting other times. If you will, they act almost like biological surrogates uh, for this complex organization. Then you move over to the narrative side, the higher, you know, higher and higher complexity where you're talking about contested political and social narratives that surround us every day. Very difficult, as you move further and further, your data on them gets weaker and weaker. You have to use increasingly qualitative analyses because uh, what's gonna be in six weeks time, what's gonna be the social narrative bouncing around uh, Westminster? Yeah, it'll probably hover around Brexit in some fashion, but there might be a fresh crisis, what reason they be it. Don't know. Then, in any political system, I was talking, you can have shock events that can happen at whatever time, boom, have it a catastrophe, uh, boom, some sort of event that just occurs out of nowhere, or for that matter, the long term, where will the British political system be, and what will be the issues in 10 years' time? Anybody's guess. That's your duck. 
The duck is flown <laughs> all over the place. And yet, at any given day, Everybody, civil servants, politicians, the society, is marching through time, managing all this high degree of uncertainty relatively well. We all live okay lives, you know, our life expectancy grows, all this sort of stuff. Uh, so if you will, we're all experts. The system is expert at managing complexity. And the key, to my mind, whenever I'm telling the students, is the ability of the policy actor and people looking at this is to say, Right, of the question I'm looking at, what are the orderly bits that I can look at in a quantitative fashion where I can apply, if you will, more traditional mechanical rules to data rules, analysis, evidence-based, if you will. Evidence-based policy works really well at this end of the spectrum. Anything over here, you've got to use qualitative stuff. And at the highly unpredictable bit, you have to, in essence, you're reduced to using experience and intuition. And I'll explain that using, this is a diagram by a guy named Ralph Stacy, who was one of the early leaders in this area. Um, and what I really like about this, in a very simple fashion, it demonstrates any policy area, I would, this I'll defend uh, quite heavily, any policy area, it shows how the mix of decision making that's going on. So all he did, it's really great, he just took two elements. So there, on the one hand, you have one access, your access of agreement, and your access of certainty. Access of agreement means how much does the, how do, how much do the actors of the society agree on whatever the question is, and how confident are we about it? How much do we know it, we understand it, et cetera? So, um, and then he just makes different zones. Now, uh, uh, i tell you what, anybody give me a policy area. Anybody, please. Brexit. Sorry. Brexit. Brexit. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. You can look at. Okay. Where is that? Uh, where is it that there's high degrees of agreement and high degrees of certainty? Brexit. We're going to push out. Where is it that you can agree um, uh, that you would say, okay, there is large that we've had. You know, in essence, you could agree. There's been a relationship. Okay. And that there's going to have to be some degree of relationship. You can you can push. I was just trying to think. You can push. You, you can push the agreement, and then you say there's going to have to be some degree of relationship, and that that relationship will have to have some actors managing it. So if you will, there will still be actors who have to. You'll you'll keep your diplomats. It's not as if you're going to remove. Uh, uh, the UK is going to remove all the diplomats. It's not as if all trade will be stopped. It's not as if all travel will be stopped. In essence, I mean, ignoring what chaos might occur on the actual day. But the implication is, I doubt you'd get people to say, no, no, we shouldn't have any travel from them. <coughs> no, no, we shouldn't have any interaction with them. No, the bulk of people would say, yeah, we should have that. And yeah, we should probably have some basic rules over that, okay? So I'd argue there'll be a degree of agreement and basic rules on that, okay, we would agree to have some sort of the detail of those rules will be messy, but you'd probably see most uh, legal experts say, yep, yeah, we can do this. And in fact, this is where simple, if you will, techno-rational bureaucratic decision-making can be made, okay? Now, obviously, with our Brexit one, you say, okay, uh, let's take some, uh, the vast um, that we'd say is highly political divisive, so, but we all know, so we want uh, airplanes going back and forth, okay? Uh, all experts agree, you've got to have rules on your airplane travel. It, it, it's, you can't take off a flight and just land it without any, you know, there's no expert out there that says we shouldn't have any rules on airplanes, okay? They should just randomly occur out of the sky. Nope, everybody agrees there should be basic rules. However, now, how should the passengers coming off those trains, uh, planes be uh, treated in terms of going through visas and customs and all this sort of stuff? Ooh, that becomes very political. Because which uh, ones require visas? Uh, what does free movement look like, et cetera? So in other words, at the same time as you're dealing with uh, all the experts agree you need, you need those cold rules, what about the actual passengers? That becomes very political. Key difference here, you move from a type of decision making, a bureaucratic one that we've uh, dealt with on protocols with determined rules and evaluation, 
to a political one. It doesn't matter how much evidence you accumulate on the efficiency of moving passengers between or how much easier it's gonna be. If it's politically important, then you move away from those simple rational decisions. Now, if you say, the other one, say, say there's something where you've got a high level of agreement, um, uh, uh, Northern, Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland's border issue, okay? The vast majority are saying there should not be uh, a border at Northern Ireland, okay? There, there are not, you know, very few actors who are saying, uh, yeah, let's get the border back up, bring the army in, bang, okay? No, everybody hates that. <coughs> problem is the various, uh, if you will, lots of agreement there. The problem is the judgmental, the, act, the experts are saying, well, wait, if you're going to do the border, we've got to use other rules. There's multiple, uh, there's, uh, there's talk of the tech, uh, tech, uh, technological solution to this. We'll put up some cameras, and this will all be done with that. But that's going to lead to other complications. If you will, the border issue itself, even if everybody agrees, and there are political aspects to it, I'm, uh, I'm kind of ignoring those. But if you're ready, it's a heavily judgment. Different experts could come up with different ways <coughs> of managing the border. So it becomes, if you will, a judgmental decision. Now, um, he what uh, uh, Ralph Stacey called the edge of chaos, I call the zone of complexity, which is a type of decisions which are a mixture of political, a mixture of judgmental, and also of technocratic rules as well. And if you will, I would argue the bulk of the things wrapping around Brexit right now are this mixture of political. So for example, any sort of free trade agreement, if you look at the way free trade agreements are made, they're often made in very apolitical situations, okay? So the big one, the big example recent one is the Canadian free trade agreement with the EU. It took seven years of you know, detailed negotiation working through, all done very quietly because in a lot of the way that free trade agreements are made is Somebody says, right, well, we're the furniture, we want a little <coughs> bit of your furniture production, and if we get a bit of that, we'll take some of your salmon, and if we're for the salmon, we need some car parts, because all the bits <coughs> interact with each other. Now, if free trade <coughs> processes in, are become <coughs> heavily politicized, then any one of those bargains can explode and block the whole process. So if you will, free trade, uh, free trade uh, agreements are often pushed into sort of a hidden technocratic bit to get the general deal, and then they get pushed out for agreement. Important to remember on the Canadian free trade agreement, does anybody remember uh, when they were, after seven years of bargaining, there was an actor who tried to stop it at the very end due to cheese regulation. Does anybody remember who that was? <coughs> This was the sub-region of Belgium, because Belgium is a federal state, so the regions, when it ratifies a treaty, uh, when it ratifies a treaty, that treaty, the regions have to agree. So the region of, uh, 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 the Wallonian region disliked, there was an element of the free trade agreement with Canada where the, the, they, they wanted their cheese recognized by the Canadians being special and so getting protected status in relation to that. And they were willing to hold up the entire seven-year process until they got their G's recognized. Okay? Now, I hate to say it, when the actual free trade agreement with the UK goes along, each country is going to be going through this process in a very political way. So that process is going to be very interesting. Then you get into your disintegration of anarchy, where you have high levels of disagreement and high levels of uncertainty. Here you're basically saying five, ten years, five, ten years down the line, where's the UK-EU relationship going to be? Right now, we're here. And this is why it's so disturbing. This is why it's so problematic. We're out here. Complex systems do not do well out here for very long. A more extreme example would be situations of civil war or chaos, Syria. I mean, so in a way, it's disturbing where we are. But because our system is so, if you will, healthy with all sorts of interactions and all these things going on, it's annoying, it's, it's not nice, but we're not going through something like Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq after the second Iraq war went through with massive societal breakdown. So for us, it's an inconvenience. It's not pleasant, but you know, we're, you know, it's always remembered the perspective on this stuff. Well, 
Okay, sorry, I've gone on too long. Just wanted to emphasize, and we can go back to this. Happy to pull up the Stacy diagram. Oh, uh, last thing I'll finish with, and I'll jump through. If you're ever looking at education stuff, the way to think of it, from an orderly perspective, education with social or health policy, causality, more targets lead to greater control and efficiency. Okay, so the more you can accumulate, the better you'll do. The better you. Reductionism. You can separate your targets. a &E waiting times, down. Children's uh, diabetes, down. Elderly care, you know, improved. All of those are separate. They have no linkage to each other. Predictability, add money, add energy, if you will. If you kind of think of mechanical systems, add money. And social health education policy will improve. Okay? You're putting more force into it, if you will. And determinism, we know how to improve social and health policy in the long run. So we know what we do now will be the appropriate thing in 10 years' time. Now, from a complexity perspective, you have partial causality. Fundamental targets may matter, uh, uh, but the tail don't. And even always remember, with fundamental targets, uh, um, actors themselves are always at interacting. So I had, a, again, my friend who was the CEO at the hospital, uh, when I said to him, uh, uh, we, were, we were having a beer, and I said, could I design a target that he couldn't cheat on? And he said, he said give it a go. And I said, right. Death rates of surgical units. If you've got a surgical unit and they're killing half their patients, um, uh, that must be a bad surgical unit. You can't hide it unless you're going to put the body somewhere. You know, it is. And he said, well, actually, if it was important that my surgical units, if, if you know, big funding, if, if target was to, have to lower their death rate, I could lower their death rate like that. And he said, right, we just wouldn't operate on the sick. You just tell somebody. If you knew that you're, in fact, I have surgical units that, you know, they're not proud of their death rate, but because they're willing to take a higher level of risk and effort, they're willing to go for it. Whereas, he said, if, if, they, if a surgical unit knew that they were going to be evaluated very firmly on how many patients died uh, in, the pr in the procedure, then boom, just don't operate on the sick. And, you know, say, sorry, it's too late for you. Uh, you're not going to make it. Okay? So he won the bet. I couldn't design a target that he couldn't adjust to. Okay. So uh, um, reductionism and holism, at best, degrees of separation. Uh, accident and emergency is one of the most expensive parts of a hospital. So when Tony Blair said, right, we're going to reduce waiting times at accident and emergency from eight hours to four hours, uh, you know, so people won't have to wait, what, of course, happens? Accident emergency times go down. More and more people flow into it because they know they're not going to wait that long. And so total usage of accident emergency goes up. So budgets for hospitals had to go up because that's the most expensive part of the hospital because you've got to have all these resources hanging around waiting for different things to come in. Predictability and uncertainty. Fundamental changes do matter, but so may minor ones. Remember uh, MRSA with washing hands? Hospitals, uh, when they started privatizing their cleaning staff, cleaning staff uh, weren't very good at uh, washing their hands. And so, uh, in essence, a whole retraining thing had to occur to get them to wash their hands uh, in the hospitals. So it's a you know, tiny little change, probabilistic, unknown long-term impact, all major policies, whatever your policies, even the ones you believe are so fundamentally good. The smoking ban. I'm not a smoker. I love the fact that I can go to a restaurant and a pub and not have to have smoke. That's now going into the next wave of smoking or, or, or different types of drugs. So the vaping, and you know, go to Canada, legalization of marijuana. Okay, that process never stops. Whatever the next wave is uh, that we'll see, emergence, <coughs> policy change creates new strategies, creates new policies. And so on and so on and so on. And interpretation, public opinion, shapes social, education, health policy, uh, interactive, adaptive, evolutionary, not static, and rigidly determined by central elites. It's democratic process. Okay, it's dem democratic process with a small d. Okay, we're not talking voting structures. Interactive. So uh, I'll skip through this other stuff. I've gone too long. Um, just general conclusions. Uh, 
uh, my personal conclusion. Key thing isn't to create a complexity toolkit. I don't, I'm not a consultant, okay? Uh, it isn't about, oh, you take these brands or you take these concepts, you apply it to your stuff and it'll all work. Uh, for me, it's about creating a complex, a pragmatic complexity culture within your organizations, within your areas. How do you create it? It's positive, inclusive, deliberative culture, recognizes the wider context, embraces the potential for reasonableness, okay? Uh, I don't believe in magic answers. It's about <coughs> being reasonable. And, and in a sense, making that a value and making that something to say, that's something we're proud of. Doesn't guarantee success, but increases the probability that you'll create a positive environment where even if you lose, your organization collapses, the policy doesn't work, you at least feel that you, you've done your best on the journey, <coughs> the pathway. And I'd argue creating that is the real power. Thank you very much for your attention.